My eyes open as I awaken from sleep. I had been resting because I have a long day ahead of me. Not that my patient knows that it's daytime. I slept while he did as well. I'd better get started. He'll be waiting for me now that the sedative I gave him has likely worn off. It's time. We have much to discuss. I open the basement door, walk down the stairs and greet him with a smile. Hello there. Let's not waste any time with pointless introductions. We have a lot of things to get done today. He sits before me bound to a chair and gagged with a solitary light bulb hanging above him. To my left is a table of supplies I'll need for this operation, ranging from a surgical scalpel and a saw to a homemade blowtorch and iron. To the right, on the floor, is a lockbox that I'm saving for later. I'm sure you're wondering who I am and why you're here. For the moment, you can think of me as the surgeon. As for the latter, we'll get to that. Let's begin your operation. He convulses left and right, struggling to free himself from his restraints. Now I understand your desire to escape, but your efforts are futile. You'll notice your wrists are restrained with steel locks built into the chair. The rest of your body is held down by an intricate system of individual ropes, all tied just as tightly as they need to be. The rope on your forehead, if you're wondering, is to prevent you from trying to choke yourself with the one around your neck. You'll probably want to during the procedure. With that said, I take the scalpel and quickly sever his Achilles tendon. This way, if he does manage to escape his restraints by some miracle, he will find it very difficult to climb the stairs. In addition, I make incision in each of his knees and cut the patellar tendons, preventing the bending of the knees. Each time I cauterized his wounds with the iron. <laughs> we wouldn't want you to bleed out now, would we? Ah, now that you're not going anywhere, let's get this show on the road. I grab the pinky of his right hand and snap it back towards him, breaking it. I do the same for each of his fingers one by one, when suddenly a song inexplicably pops into my head and I begin singing. The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout, down came the rain and washed the spider out. The patient's heart monitor beeps rapidly. It's time to take a break until it settles down a bit. With each finger broken, he'll find it quite impossible to grip anything. Regardless, I decide to systematically sever each one with the saw and cauterize the resulting wounds. He begins to go into shock and I rush to retrieve a syringe of adrenaline. After being injected, he jolts back to consciousness. Welcome back. I don't suppose you thought we were done already. Why, we're just getting started. You've lost a lot of blood. I'll need to start you on a saline drip while I go scrub up. We've made a considerable mess already. By now I've grown quite used to the muffled screams of the patient, and for a moment I wonder what the silence will be like when I'm done. Upon returning with a fresh pair of gloves and a clean face mask, I notice he's still wriggling back and forth. I very nearly pity him. There is much more work to be done. Next, I crouch down to work on his toes. Perhaps in keeping with my song from earlier, with each break I recite what happened to each little piggy. Upon the last one, I decided to remove his gag as to imply that the final pig had unleashed an unbridled scream all the way home. <laughs> I put it back on and proceeded to the removal portion. He nearly went into shock again, but I was able to stabilize him. Well, it looks like we're about halfway through the procedure. The next part is the most delicate, so I'm going to have to ask you to remain as motionless as possible. Just trust me, I'm a doctor. I start by carefully removing the eyelid of his left eye, 
I imagine he's beginning to wish I had been working with an anesthesiologist. I retrieve a long, thin tool to reach in and sever the optic nerve. Once that is done, I can safely remove the eye. Don't worry. You'll only need the one for what I have planned for later. A small comfort, I know. But surgery is never pleasant. Next, I liberate the small piece of cartilage from the middle of his face. I seal off the wound with the iron and take a deep breath. Now it's time for the most important part. Once I'm done with this, we'll talk about what you've probably been wondering this whole time. His remaining eye flashes terror as I unzip his pants. Using the saw, I remove his manhood as his muffled screams grow even louder than before. He must be starting to lose his voice at this point, the resilient little bastard. Tears begin pouring out of his eye like a waterfall, and I stop the bleeding, but with the blowtorch this time. Once again, he went into shock. Only this time, I had to use an electric defibrillator to bring him back to consciousness. Now, why would you want to check out before the main event? I pose as I reach for the lockbox. You're finally going to find out why you're here. I imagine you're feeling pretty helpless right now, and as it happens, that's your first clue. Another is the fact that we are in a dark basement, and yet another is the very fact that you're restrained with rope, and there's duct tape over your mouth. By now, you may have figured it out, but your biggest clue was the last thing I took from you. I open the lockbox and show him the picture of my daughter. How helpless did you make her feel when she was bound and gagged in your basement? What tortures did you put her through before you ended her suffering? How did it feel when the courts left you off on a technicality? Did it feel good? His eye looked down at the floor, either feeling some semblance of guilt or, more likely, resigned to his fate. Tonight, justice is served as the court of law can never serve it as a dish of well-deserved revenge. I shove the picture down his throat and plunge a knife into his gut. <sighs> I breathe a sigh of relief. Justice is done. Then, I turn around and head up the stairs, leaving him to bleed to death. I used your toothbrush, he told her, coming into the room with a steaming mug of coffee. That's not part of the bargain, my new friend. My toothbrush is my toothbrush. It only brushes my teeth, she said, gently prodding his sternum. Who said anything about teeth? So, I can explore every centimeter of your body every moist crevice, and I can watch you while you sleep, but ensuring that I don't succumb to the dreaded gum disease gingivitis isn't part of the bargain. No, nope, nine and yet, she said flatly. They sat on her bed together, rumpled in disheveled sheets piled around them, morning light falling onto the scattered clothes on the floor. She wore his button-down shirt and played with the cuffs. You know, you're quite charming and seductive, she said, tracing one well-manicured fingernail along the inside of his thigh. Charming and seductive enough, in a perfect stranger sort of way, to hook up after only one date. But you're not use my toothbrush charming and seductive. Not yet, anyway. She gestured toward him with her mug of coffee and tipped her head a bit. But you were able to guess how I like my coffee. So, you get bonus points for that. Maybe even. She trailed off, looking up at the ceiling for a moment, silently mouthing numbers and ticking them off on her fingers. Maybe even enough bonus points for round four. She gave him a quick wink. Oh good lord, he said. You're a winker. I hate winkers. Besides, I think it'd be round five, technically. But who's counting, anyway? Yes. It all sort of blended together after a bit, didn't it? What did you put in my drink? She said, teasingly. God, I'm going to be late for work again. 
It's nearly nine. I overslept around. <laughs> he looked at her, raising an eyebrow. That was a pun, she said. I got it. Be a dear and get me a fill-up, would you? She asked him. She held out her nearly empty mug to him. The pink mug read, Here's a cup of calm the fuck down in a looping script. She drew it back to herself and, after a second, a look of confusion passing briefly over her eyes. Hey, how do you make coffee, grinding the beans and all that, without waking up my flatmate? She wakes up when a mouse farts in this tiny place. He held his hand out for the mug, bending his fingers up in a give-it-to-me gesture. When she handed it to him, he headed out of the bedroom door to the kitchen. As he went down the hall, he called out, Oh, I have my ways. She thought she heard the front door click shut a moment later. When he didn't return after a few minutes, she went to the kitchen. There, she found her flatmate, face down on a puddle of blood and yogurt at the table, the bristle end of a toothbrush jammed deeply into her ear. We got married two years ago. Tom's a good guy, he's got a great job, is kind to me, and now, pretty much every day since we got married, I can get that good dick. It would be unfair to say I'm insatiable. My sex drive is high, yes, but what my husband gives me is enough. I don't crave any more than what he brings to the bedroom. It's just enough. It's perfect. And like I said, it's good. If you've had anything like it, you know what I'm talking about. Last night, after we'd finished up and were getting ready for bed, I whispered to him my appreciation for everything he does. He does so much. He smiled and kissed my nose, and we went to sleep, content and basking in a haze of afterglow. One night last week I did have to go without. Tom was stuck at work. There had been an accident, so he and his co-workers were busy taking care of the aftermath. It had been a train crash. It was all over the news. There were at least 40 dead. My heart went out to each and every one of the deceased, but I still miss Tom. I hate sleeping alone. Eventually, I drifted off, only to be plagued by nightmare after nightmare. Awful stuff, most of which involved my husband. I imagined him among the accident victims, surrounded by the dead, people who had so much potential, people who were cut down in their prime, such a waste of lives, a waste of everything. Tom came home at dawn and found me tossing and turning, still in the throes of some terrible dream. He woke me as gently as he could, then got into bed with me and stroked my hair. He held me as I calmed down. His gaze of love and concern brought me back to reality quickly. Welcome home, I said smiling. It's great to be back, Tom replied returning my grin. We cuddled for a while, but like usual, one thing led to another, and soon we were naked and writhing around in the sheets. He looked amazing. He felt even better. Hold that thought. He got up and crossed the room. He reached in his work duffel bag and took out a rolled up towel, and then came back to me. Take your pick, he told me, grinning impishly. He unrolled the cloth, and three tumbled out onto the bed. My eyes widened. One was spectacular. I stroked it, feeling the veins under the tight skin. It was even partially hard. Are these from... From the accident. Oh man, it was brutal. Parts were torn off, everyone. These were ripe for the picking. Well, I think they're just perfect. So, is it that one? Tom asked, pointing to the one I was still stroking with absent-minded reverence. I thought for a moment before I answered. I think this is a special occasion. Let's go with two. Tom beamed. So, one for me and one for you? Hmm, I pondered. Better make it three.
Everybody knows that if you surf the web long enough, you'll see some pretty sick shit. This is especially true if you intentionally dwell into the dark underbelly of the internet. I've seen quite a few things I don't care to admit to, but one thing that I'll always remember is a site called normalpornfornormalpeople.com. The first strange thing about the site was that I didn't find it by actually looking for it. It was emailed to me by someone I didn't know. The email was as follows. Hi there. Found this site. Is very nice. Thought you might like. Normalpornfornormalpeople.com. Pass it on. For the good of mankind. Pretty standard issue chain letter. Although the URL and last remark really piqued my curiosity. I was having a very boring day when I got this, so I made sure my antivirus was working and then I clicked it. It was a very average, very generic looking site. It gave the impression that the creators just barely gave a shit about making it look professional. The author seemed to have a very tenuous grasp on English and on the front page was a long, boring and incoherent rant that I don't remember or have saved. The site had a strange tagline, which even today people haven't figured out the meaning of, which was Normal Porn for Normal People, a website dedicated to the eradication of abnormal sexuality. And from the sound of that, I wasn't sure whether I was here to watch porn or if I had stumbled onto some kind of eugenics program. But I was here now and I was very, very curious to see what normal people get their rocks off to. So I scrolled down through the rant and nothing. The page didn't seem to link anywhere else, and I was about to leave when I noticed every word of the rant was its own hyperlink. So I clicked one of them, and was sent to a white page with a very long list of links in the form of normalpornfornormalpeople.com slash random letters. So I stopped for a minute and asked myself if I really wanted to waste God knows how much time clicking random links that will likely give me a virus that will rape my computer. I figured I'd just try it for maybe five minutes, just to see if anything came up. I clicked one of the links and was sent to another page. This page apparently had totally different URLs than the last one. I was just about to say fuck this when I clicked on the third link, and a video download came up. It was called peanut.avi. It was a 30 minute video of a man, a woman, and a dog in a kitchen. The woman would make a peanut butter sandwich, and the man would set it down for the dog to eat. And this was all that happened for 30 minutes. It was obvious that the cameraman had to stop filming and wait until the dog was ready to eat again, and the dog seemed rather sick by the end of it. I know what you're thinking. What the hell does that have to do with porn? I have no clue. I've seen a little over two dozen videos from this site, and the majority had no sexual activity at all. After watching Peanut.avi, I went on a certain image board I frequent to play online show and tell, like I always do with weird shit like this. But someone had already made a thread about it, some guy who had received the same chain letter I did. The image board thread got lots of people with nothing better to do to dig through the site, and that's how I saw other videos. Most of those two dozen videos were very uneventful, and consisted of people talking to the cameraman in a room with nothing in it but a desk and a few chairs. I mean literally nothing on the walls or in terms of furniture. The whole room had a very cold, sterile feel to it. The conversations were just idle banter about previous jobs or embarrassing childhood moments. I kept expecting some kind of discussion about what the people were filming and what the site was about, but of course, nothing. You would never know these videos had anything to do with porn if you saw it out of context. I will say one thing though. The people who appeared in these videos were quite attractive. However, the other video that actually did feature content, which I suppose could be called sexual, is where things got weird. I'll give you a brief description of the stranger videos. If you're really eaten up with curiosity, you can try to hunt them down on a torrent site. LickedClean.avi A 10 minute video filmed by a hidden camera in which we see a repairman working on a washing machine for the first two minutes. When it's fixed, the repairman talks to the owner briefly and then leaves. The owner checks to make sure the repairman is gone and he begins to lick all over the top of the washing machine. This goes on for seven minutes. Jimbo.avi A five minute video of an obese mime performing his act. It was actually pretty funny, particularly one part where he pretends to pull up a chair, then pretends that it breaks because of his weight. 
In the last 30 seconds of the video, the camera cuts to static briefly and cuts back to the man sobbing quietly, still wearing mime outfit and makeup. Some kind of obscure fetish? Diana.avi Four minute video in which the cameraman talks to a woman in a room different from the interview room. This room looks like one you'd find in a normal person's house. Exactly where they are is never specified as Deanna only talks about her violin playing. She obviously plays her violin, but she keeps getting distracted by something. I didn't notice this until someone on the image board thread pointed it out, but if you look in the mirror, in the background, you could see a fat man in a chicken mask masturbating. Jessica.avi Another four minute cameraman video. This time he's outside of a house talking to another young woman. They talk about canoe rides. The camera zooms out to reveal the city streets behind them occasionally. The strange thing is, no one so far has been able to identify where the street is. Guesses have ranged anywhere from Europe to Australia to the Philippines, but there's yet to be a match for the streets shown in the video. Tongue-tied.avi 10 minute video. The first five minutes consist of an elderly woman making out with a mannequin. The video cuts out like it did in Jimbo.avi halfway through, and the scene is now a group of mannequins huddled together in a circle around the camera. The lights have been dimmed, and the elderly woman is nowhere to be seen. From this point on, there is no sound. Stumps.avi Five minute long video where a man with no legs is attempting to break dance on a DDR mat in what looks like the kitchen from Peanut.avi, but much dirtier. There's a radio playing music unseen in the background, but it stops at the four minute mark when the man collapses on the mat in exhaustion. He breathes heavily and pleads with someone off screen to let him rest. This off screen person becomes terrifyingly enraged and yells at him to keep dancing, which he does. You can hear this off screen person begin to scream as the video ends abruptly. Privacy.avi the woman from Diana.avi is masturbating on a mattress in the interview room while the man from Stumps.avi walks around on his hands while wearing some kind of goblin mask. The door in the room was always closed in other videos, but it's now open. In this video, the only light is in the room, and the hallway is dark. Near the end of the video, you can see an animal quickly run through the hallway. And finally, the last video we uncovered useless.avi In this 18 minute video, a blonde woman from one of the previous interview videos is tied down to a mattress in the interview room. She attempts to scream but her mouth is taped over. After 7 minutes, a man in a black suit and mask opens the door, but he does not enter. He holds the door open for the animal that was running in the hall in the previous video. It's revealed to be an adult chimpanzee. Its hair shaved and its entire body painted red. It seemed to be starved and abused, with several wounds along its shoulders and back. When the chimp enters the room, the masked man closes the door behind it. The chimpanzee sniffs the air for a moment and notices the woman tied to the mattress. It goes into a frenzy and begins to maul her. The assault goes on for a grueling seven minutes until the woman finally dies. The chimp eats flesh from her corpse for four minutes as the video ends. The thread exploded with activity after this video was uncovered and people discussed it long into the night. When I came back to the image board the next day, I found that the thread was deleted. I tried to start another one and they banned me. I tried emailing the guy who sent me the chain letter with the site's URL, sent him five messages and never got a response. I have tried to discuss this website on various places and I got banned frequently. The site itself was also deleted about three days after useless.avi was uncovered, likely because someone contacted the authorities about it. The only proof that normal porn for normal people ever existed was a few screen caps people took and videos from the site that people saved and uploaded on torrents, the most popular of which being useless.avi, which found its way onto a few gore sites. Wherever you upload them to, all of the videos from normalpornfornormalpeople.com 
get deleted after a while. I don't remember when the nightmares began. It feels like they've been plaguing me for so long. I've forgotten what it feels like to get a restful night's sleep. Every night, I relive the same horrible ordeals. It's gotten to the point that I dread going to sleep every night, but I just can't seem to stop myself. I just can't stay awake. My name is Anna. I'm a pretty typical high school girl. Scratch that, I'm completely typical. Normal house, normal neighborhood, normal family, normal friends, normal education. Nice and normal, just the way I like it. The only thing that's really abnormal about me is these dreams I've been having lately. When I first told my friends about them, they laughed and said I was worrying over nothing. Dreams can't hurt you. Put your mind on some happier thoughts and eventually the nightmares will go away. Since then, I've tried to follow their advice. Really, I have. I've been nothing but cheerful at school, led my normal family home life. Now that I think about it, nothing in my life has changed recently. Nothing in my life has really changed ever. I've been living just the way I have for as long as I can remember. Why did I suddenly start getting these nightmares now? None of it makes any sense. There's no reason for me to be having dreams like these. I still remember last night's. Luckily, it was one of the tamer ones, comparatively speaking, but it still robbed me of a perfectly good night's sleep. I was chained up in a dark, stone room with no windows and one iron door. My dream self must have been kept there for days because it smelled of my own... leavings. Eventually, a dark-skinned man came into the room and dropped a bowl of foul-smelling food in front of me. It was covered in mold, and consisted mainly of what looked like scraps of what his master must have thrown out. But my dream self didn't care. I ate the food eagerly on all fours, like I had done before. I didn't feel hungry. It was just a dream. I couldn't even taste the mold. Maybe my dream self was just desensitized to these sensations, or maybe I'm just overthinking things. I usually can't taste or feel acute bodily functions when I'm dreaming. My friends find it weird that I can smell things, though. I wonder if that's not normal. I hear most people don't even dream in color, so maybe there's something at least a little special about me after all. It's been almost a week since I took their advice of having a positive outlook, and I've finally decided that it isn't working. I need to talk to someone about it. I mean really talk. And I don't really feel comfortable talking to my parents about the kinds of dreams I'm having. I haven't told my friends any details about what actually happens in my dreams yet either, but today I'm going to talk to them about it. I just need someone to listen, to know what I'm going through. I told my friends about the dreams, leaving out some of the messier details. They just started making fun of how weird and twisted I was inside, calling me a masochist and pervert, bondage queen. They were just joking, of course. I knew that, and they knew I knew it, but still, I wished they had listened to me a little more seriously. I guess part of having such normal friends is that they don't really know how to deal with abnormal things like what I'm going through. Maybe they're right, though. Maybe I am just a pervert with some weird, suppressed desires or fetishes or something that I don't know about that's manifesting themselves in my dreams. But then I recall the awful, terrible things I've gone through on some nights. There was no way I wanted any part of that. Not me and not any part of me, no matter how deep down it was. There was a word for these dreams, and that word was nightmare. There was nothing glamorous about them. If the nightmares continue, I'll try talking to them one more time. Maybe this time they'll actually listen. Last night, I was in the same room again. This time, I was chained upright, hanging from the ceiling with a ball gag in my mouth. Once again, I was naked, like an animal. My body felt weak, you know. Like when you try to punch in a dream, and it feels like you're punching through water, and your muscles just don't react and move like they're supposed to. My whole body was like that, totally unable to kick or struggle or put up any kind of fight. 
Then, the dark-skinned man came in. This time, he was accompanied by his master, a man in a white stage mask who I'd dreamt about once or twice before. Those were always the worst dreams, and when I saw him walk through that door, my heart sank as I knew this wasn't going to be a pleasant night. It was easy to tell what he wanted. As the dark-skinned man lowered me just so on my chains, the masked man began to violate me, just as he had in the past. I couldn't resist at all. I knew it was pointless to fight a nightmare. The affair must have lasted for several hours in dream time, but fortunately, it only felt like minutes to me. I submit myself to the inevitable, and just like that, it was over, and again I lay, weak and naked, on the cold, stone floor. The two men left the room with an amused banter, and in my weakened haze, I gradually woke up to reality. The first thing I thought after waking up was, what the hell is wrong with me? The whole depraved masochist argument might start to actually hold water if I keep having dreams like this. I knew I couldn't tell my friends about this one. They would just hold it over my head with an onslaught of I told you so's and joking insults until I finally drop the subject and we inevitably start talking about something more mundane, like the new guys at school, or that falafel stand that just opened up nearby. For now, I just had to grip my teeth and bear it. The day passed like any other boring, normal day, and before I knew it, I once again found myself lying in my bed, dreading what was to come, but knowing that there was nothing I could do to prevent it. After all, it's not as if I can just never sleep again, right? I hear that, supposedly, a person will die if she goes more than ten days without sleep. Or maybe that was water. Could be both. Maybe. Whatever. I'm too tired to think about anything like that right now. Just too tired. Last night's dream was even worse than the one before it. I was strung up again, but this time I was whipped, beaten by the dark man. Apparently I had done something to offend his master, and even though I had no idea what it was, I apologized and I apologized over and over again. I apologized. My efforts were wasted, though. It was plain to see in his eyes that he was enjoying striking me, and the only way it would end was when he had his fill and finally felt satisfied. Each strike of his whip stung in that weird sort of dream pain that you sometimes feel in really, really realistic dreams. It wasn't one of those things where you don't actually feel anything and just suddenly jump in your sleep because your body flinches in reaction to what it thinks is coming, but an actual sensation of pain or not really regular pain, but more sort of a stinging, numbing sensation. Is it weird that I can feel things like that in my dreams, but not feel hungry? I'm also able to go to the bathroom in my dreams without having any accidents in real life. People tell me that's weird, too. Maybe I'm not as normal as I thought I was, but I suppose that's been made pretty obvious by these messed up dreams I'm having, hasn't it? When the dark man finished his gleeful onslaught, he dropped me very suddenly and violently to the floor, then kicked me and walked out of the room. It looked like my dream self wasn't getting any moldy supper tonight. As I lay on the ground, weakly rolling in my own self-pity, I hazily awoke once again. This has to stop. I'm going to tell my friends the whole story today, without censoring myself and I'm going to make sure that they understand how distraught I am by all of this. I really need someone to listen and be there for me right now. I just need to know that someone cares, so I won't feel like God himself has abandoned me anymore. I'm going to meet them in a private place after school today. Maybe the third floor landing. No one ever goes up there for anything. I'm going to spill my guts and tell them everything, and if they still don't take me seriously, I'll make them. No matter how long we all have to stay there and discuss it. I had the weirdest daydream in class today. I really must not be getting enough sleep if I'm conking out at my desk. At least this time it wasn't one of those nightmares I've been plagued with for so long. Seems I only have those at night, hence the name I guess, huh? Still, it did feel like it might have something to do with them. It was hazier, more surreal sort of dream than the hard, easily recollectable sort that I've grown accustomed to having as of late. I remember being on an island, 
A very seedy, run-down island, like Somalia or something. Not that Somalia is an island, but you know what I mean. I was bound and gagged, seems to be a common theme, and surrounded by men wearing bandanas for face masks. In front of me there was a rowboat, and offshore there was a much larger vessel stalled atop the waves. I don't remember how I supposedly got there, but I think I remember being on vacation or something. You know, there's always that sort of dream omniscience that lets you know things that you shouldn't know because you didn't actually dream about them. One of the masked men poked me in the back with a rifle, prodding me onto the boat. Another man, this one taller and darker than the rest and wearing a different kind of mask, got into the boat with me and started rowing me offshore towards the anchored ship. There was something kind of familiar about him, but I woke up before anything else happened. I was a little shaken up by the dream, but I still was determined to talk to my friends and get them to understand what I was going through. I managed to get them all up to the third floor landing of the school's stairwell and corner them there. I told them that I really needed to talk and that this time I really needed them to listen. They looked at me curiously, and I started telling them everything. All of the horrible details of what I've been going through night after night after night. The abuse, the rape, the beatings, the vile conditions, and even some of the really gross stuff I haven't mentioned up to this point. Like when I dreamt that the masked man made me clean the whole floor of my cell with my tongue. That was probably the worst one. All three of them stood in awe by what I was describing to them, and when I finished, they just stared at me like I was crazy or something. Who knows, maybe I was crazy. Maybe I just needed them to support me so that I could stop being crazy. But life is never that easy. Their eyes lowered in a sarcastic sort of glare as all three of them looked at each other and then at me. They told me that there was just no helping me. They said that they had tried to be supportive and to hear me out as I talked about all these crazy dreams and perverted crap, but that they had just had enough and they didn't want anything to do with this anymore. They told me I just wasn't worth it. My heart sank when they said this. My friends, or these people that I thought were my friends anyway, had abandoned me. They were my only support and now they were gone. They walked back downstairs, telling me to just leave them alone from now on, and there was nothing else I could do. I was now alone in the world. No friends. No parents. No parents. It never occurred to me until just now, but I just realized something. I can't remember my parents' faces. I must see them at least daily, every morning at breakfast and every night at dinner, but I can't remember any of that either. I can't remember ever getting up or getting ready for school. I can't remember eating breakfast, saying goodbye to my parents, or coming home to see them after school. All I can remember is being here, at school, with my so-called friends. That, and lying in bed, either having just woken up from another night's terrible ordeal, or anxiously awaiting the one to come. Where did all the rest of the time go? And just like that, I awake. Now, here I lay, on my cold, stone prison floor, unable to feel the hunger that eats at me, or the pain of my scars left from yesterday. I can smell the horrible stench of the room that surrounds me, and it is here that I realize that I have been abandoned, left to the mercy of my cruel captors. I don't remember when the dreams began. For a while, it felt like I would be able to find escape in them forever. But now, as I lie, weak and forlorn, the only comfort I am able to provide myself is found in three empty little words. I am real. It didn't take long for me to realize that something was amiss. Usually, nobody would suspect me the quiet little bookworm of having so many creepy little, though I regret to call them this, fetishes. It wasn't as if I didn't know that such things were wrong, it's just that I didn't think any harm could be done if I just thought about them and didn't act. Only one part of the whole thing began to worry me. 
I used to separate what I do to soothe my hormones and what I did to soothe my mind separately. Then I found myself disgusted when I noticed what the combination of both did to me. It scared me and eventually that fear grew into excitement. Soon this became my little piece of paradise. I knew it was sick, but letting my imagination roam was completely harmless, right? I remember just falling back on my bed behind a locked door and letting my hands slip between my legs, finding a fulfilling satisfaction as I closed my eyes and let my fingers tease around wet panties. This wasn't too different from what I had done as a teenager, but however, what was on my mind was quite different. I used to think of the boys I wanted to lure into my bedroom, but was always too shy to. I even had the occasional fantasy of women I admired, not that I'd ever tell them about it. But this? This was different. My imagination transformed my room into a dusty and dark place with blood-stained sheets. In fact, the coppery scent of blood overtook my senses for a moment, only to cause me to snap back to reality. When I opened my eyes, the smell was gone. I always did have a powerful imagination. This continued for a few more months. Every time, the thoughts got more and more vivid. Once I was past finding something disturbing, I would embrace it and it would become a new nasty little thing that I could get off on. I only shook myself from one thought that kept returning. I kept mutilating my lover. I remember in that repeating thought, I had his wrists and ankles tied to the bedposts. It was just a normal daydream of an adult romp. That is until I started stabbing him in non-vital areas of the body. I usually snapped out of it at that point, yet that sick little part of me wouldn't let me go. I carved my name into his chest as he screamed in pain, his cries muffled by nothing other than my left hand. Though he struggled and flailed, I only stayed where I was. No amount of what he could do while bound would buck me off. I admired my work, removing my left hand from his mouth. Of course, he began to accuse me of being a crazy bitch. I refused to hear it all. I grabbed a pillow and held it over his face until his body quit thrashing. He had lost consciousness. I tossed the pillow aside and looked down to him. He looked like he was sleeping. He looked so peaceful. Normally something like that would warm my heart, but there was something wrong. He wasn't smiling. I drew my knife across his mouth, carving a smile into his face. He woke as I was just finishing, screaming and thrashing all over again. Oh, I wanted to look at him. I wanted to see that pretty smile. I wanted to see my name and the way that it marked his perfect white skin but he wouldn't let that happen. 
I kissed his bloody mouth, and the last thing it did was soothe him like it used to. He cried, and I licked away the tears. The tears and the blood mixing only made my heart race. It was like I was in love for the first time. I opened my eyes this time. I opened them, and then I saw that it wasn't my imagination anymore. I pulled my mouth from his and stared down to him. Tears continued to streak his cheeks, and the fresh wounds I had left on his face were still bleeding. My heart was throbbing in my chest, and I drew my hands up to my face to gasp in shock. It wasn't my imagination. What about all of those other things I dreamed up? Had I done those too? I stared down into those accusing eyes. I could hear him trying to say something, but he was too hoarse from his screams to even speak. For some reason, I felt no regret. I knew I should, but I didn't. A grin began to creep over my face. I felt the corners of my lips being tugged at, even though I knew this was no time to be smiling. Still half naked, I leaned over him only to whisper sweetly, Baby, you've made me so happy. Afterwards, I curled my arms around him to sleep. I don't know what made me do that. I don't know if I really cared at the time or if I was happy with what I turned him into. He was mine now. Even if he got away from me somehow, I don't think anyone would want him now. We had broken up a few times previously and I knew that he had seen other women, but who would want him now? I'd still want him. I kept him tied down and I kept feeding him and giving him water. He refused the first few times, but eventually he just let it happen. He caved to my will. I told him what a good boy he was, and he only sobbed and kept repeating one phrase. Why, Cassie, why? Soon, his friends had realized that they hadn't seen him. They must have known something had happened. When they arrived, they realized how weird I was acting. They shoved past me only to find him in the state I had left him in. I knew that I was officially fucked. That's how I got where I am now. I'm in a mental institution. I never heard from Jason again, but now I have other focuses. I close my eyes and my fantasies come to life. I'm actually quite happy this way. I only regret one thing. I wish I could taste the combination of blood and tears again. I've been on welfare for the past 10 years. I look for jobs as much as I can, but when the nearest 9 to 5 is a 2 hour bus ride away, and wants a college degree just to consider you, it's hard. I still look, but let's be honest, the odds are against me. But a guy's gotta have something to do, right? So my thing to do is porn. I got nothing else and I'm a man right? But my internet connection shit because fucking Comcast has a monopoly around here 
so I can't watch porn online like a normal person after rent it from a shop a while away. And the worst part of it is that I can barely afford it. I can't afford to get laid and that's bad enough, but I can't even afford to buy my own porn. It's like the fucking cherry on a pile of horse shit. I pay rent for my shitty studio apartment and I pay for my food and then I've got about $100 to take me through the month without going insane. So I rent porn and not the good stuff from Evil Angel, Bang Bros and all the other big name studios. No, that stuff is top shelf so it's apparently too good for people like me. I go for the bottom shelf, a dollar a day rentals from the small studios. Half the time you can tell that they are shot with GoPro and mashed together with Windows Movie Maker. Uh, I guess I'm supporting indie artists, but who gives a shit? Most of their stuff sucks and I can't even get hard to it sometimes. But I can't stop coming back for more. And last month, I got into real trouble because I didn't have the dollar in my pocket that I needed to rent one of those crap DVDs. Tried to talk to the clerk, asked him to cut me a break since I'm a regular and all that, but he wasn't having any of it. Fucking hippie. He's the reason why this country's going to hell in a handbasket. Anyway, he kept saying no, no, and no again, no matter what I said until I finally reached into my pocket, grabbed something, and slammed it on the counter. I didn't even know what it was. There, I said. What'll that get me? It was a quarter and a dime, and that was all. Thirty-five fucking cents, all I had to my name. At first, I thought he was going to laugh and kick me out of the shop, but then he pointed down at the bottom shelf of a rack of CBT and pissing stuff. I don't usually get that since it's too expensive, but there was one DVD down there that was only 30 cents a night. You know how they say you get what you pay for? Well, that's true. This movie, when they printed the cover, they must have misaligned the paper sheets because everything was a little crooked. There were a couple of typos on the back, too, and the title was the most generic title I've ever seen in my life. Obviously, I'm not going to say what it is, but if you guess something like POV, Mexican blowjob, slut, you'd be pretty close to the money. The cover photo was of this dark Mexican chick with a really nasty snaggle tooth wearing a bikini and looking at the camera. Now, usually, porn cover photos are exciting, you know. The girl will have an inviting expression on her face like she wants to be there or she'll be getting fucked or something. But this one was like nothing was going on nothing at all. She was there, but she wasn't there. I can't explain it any other way. Whatever, I took the DVD and told the clerk to keep the change. It's a long walk home. It always is. But I kind of like it. Drives up the anticipation, you know. Gets the blood flowing. So by the time I got home, I was in the mood, just like always. I dropped my shorts popped in the DVD, opened up a bag of Cheetos, and started to jerk it. That's one thing about the movie. There's no friggin' DVD menu to bother with. It just gets right into it. The movie is shot POV style, so there's this dude kind of laying down in a room of some kind. The chick from the cover walks through a door with a big frosted glass panel. Kind of dances a little bit and then crawls towards the camera. She starts to fill up the guy's shorts before she unzips them and starts to do her thing. No story, no bullshit, nothing. Great, right? Maybe not. To be honest, she's not really good at the whole blowjob thing. The dude's cock doesn't look that big, but she can't throw it. Not even when he puts his hands on the back of her head and helps her out. Even when he slaps her and uses both hands, she can't take it all. I guess I gotta give her credit for trying, though. 
Most chicks won't go to the point of crying and puking through their noses like that. I got off about halfway through the video, but I kept eating Cheetos and watching anyway. Nothing better to do, I guess. Plus, it was kind of funny seeing that dumb bitch choke like that. But I started to notice something really weird about the video. She kept looking off screen. Editing takes care of that in the professional stuff, but even for a homemade porno, she looked off screen a lot. And not at the dude who was filming, either. She kept looking above and to the right of him. And every time she did that, she'd kind of wince and get back to what she was doing like she had something to prove. It was like there was something there that scared her a lot. And then I realized something else. The room the film was shot in, I knew where it was. I worked in that building for three years. The trucking company I used to work for leased it. Now, that was ten years ago, and I heard the company shut down after they fired me. Probably because they fired me, but I still remembered where the building was, so I figured, damn, why not check the place out? I'd never been to a porn studio before, and besides, I'd get a kick out of seeing my old office used as a porn set. Hell, if I showed up, maybe they'd give me a job. Now, it's a ways to that part of the city. A long ways, probably eight, nine miles, and I don't got a car or bike, so I had to walk it. But hey, it's like an adventure, right? So I grabbed my flashlight and a beer and got going. Bugs were fucking everywhere, and it was probably 80 degrees, 80% humidity, even though it was after 8 o'clock at night. Whatever. It's Florida. I'm used to it. Eventually, I got to the building, and I got pissed off right away. The damn thing was shuttered. Probably had been for years. There were plants growing over it and shit, and half the windows were busted up, and the other half were boarded. I cursed and threw my bottle at the front door, and wouldn't you know it? The damn thing creaked open. So, I went inside. It was dark, so I turned on my flashlight, and... I'm glad I did that right away. The floor was covered with needles and shit. Literal human shit. The place stunk up a storm, but I figured, hey, I've come this far. It'd be a shame to turn back now. So I keep going. Someone else must have leased the place after my company left it. The layout had changed a lot, and they converted the lobby to even more office rooms and cubicles. There were a lot of corners there. You know, a lot of things I couldn't see. A lot of places where anything might pop out and friggin' kill me. A bum with a knife, a black punk with a gun, a meth head, anything. But fuck it, right? I wasn't going to turn back. I made my way through the lobby, or what was once the lobby. Since I was the only person there, and since the whole building is just plain concrete block, my footsteps echoed a lot. At least I hoped they were echoes. I got to the hallway that led to my office, and that was the worst part of it. My flashlight's not that bright, and the hallway is long, so you can't really see the end of it when it's dark like that. I admit it. I got kind of scared at that point. I walked as quietly as I could and tried to hold my breath. My flashlight was a dead giveaway, but I figured it was worth it. Going down that hallway in pitch blackness, I don't know if I could have done it. Eventually, I got to my office. The number painted above the door must have faded years ago, but I recognized it anyway. Fifth on the right, and the only one with the glass panel over the door. They took out the solid door after some bitch from HR almost caught me jacking off during my lunch break. My own friggin' lunch break. So I opened the door and found nothing. Just nothing. Not even dust. That's what tipped me off that something was weird about the place. Didn't take me a minute to realize what. The whole room smelled like laundry. Like bleach. And when I looked real closely at the floor trim, 
I could see that the bottom edges of it were kind of stained, kind of eaten away at, like the whole friggin' floor had been doused with bleach. I ran the spot of my flashlight along where the floor met the wall to see if there were any other clues, and that's when I saw it. The ugly, yellow, snuggletooth, right there on the edge of the floor. I picked it up and had a look at it. The blood on it was still purple, like it hadn't been out in the air for that long. I walked out of the room, holding it in my hand, but I kept smelling the bleach, and when I looked down the hallway, I didn't see any dust, or needles, or shit there either, so I put the tooth in my pocket and kept going. That clean trail led all the way down the hall, like all the way, all the way up to a door that I fucking kicked down and then it continued down these old wooden stairs and then it just ended. All of a sudden, the smell of the bleach ended, but that was fine. There was a really obvious trail through the dirt and the gravel out towards the woods, and then there was a gap in the bushes, and then there was a creek, and then, well, and then is the reason I don't watch porn anymore, or in blow-up dolls, or any of that shit. It's eight or nine miles to the building, and I don't got a car or a bike, but I kind of like it. Drives the anticipation up, you know. Gets the blood flowing. It was such a chilling notion for a girl of 12 years old to have, but it had always been obvious to me. My mama hated me. She loathed me. She wished for my demise, as I wished for hers. She never treated me like a daughter. She refused to buy me pretty clothes that all my friends have. She refused to let me help her cook. She didn't even let me stay home alone. What she said to me daily was, Go outside. Don't come home. I never want to see you home. At night, she always forced me to eat more than I want. Poultry, pork, cheese... She chose the foods that would make me feel fat and force them down my throat. Then she stayed around to make sure I didn't puke it up later. She made me feel fat and ugly. I'd never be pretty to anyone. I had soft black hair, but Mama never let me grow it long. When I grew breasts and curves, she stopped cutting it short and just shaved my whole head bald. She did it because she was jealous. Because my hair was nicer. Because I was the prettier one in the family. I could tell she was jealous of me. I could see my father only giving me the attention and not her. My wretched, devilish mama never let me do anything fun. No singing, dancing, or anything that makes me feel pretty and good. She dressed me with the worst, most boyish clothes she could find and then paraded me around the neighborhood. I got looks of pity from everyone and the only thing I could do is bow my head in embarrassment. I looked at my bald head and my smelly clothes and decided I had enough. The next time she told me what to do, I wasn't going to do it. Mama came into my room and told me to go play outside. I didn't move. She came towards me and started to yell. I gripped the knife I had hidden under my blanket and stabbed it right into her heart. She fell down onto her knees and said, I'm sorry. I love you. Her eyes went blank and she slumped forward. Her blonde hair mixed with the blood made me feel free. I could finally live the way I wanted to. I took a portion of the long platinum blonde hair and held it to my head, imagining what it would be like to have long hair. The thought of it made me smile. Then my father walked in. My father understood why I did it. He even helped me bury the body. He let me become the woman I could have been a long time ago. I was sleeping when I learned the truth about Mama. It was when my father came into my room and laid next to me. His hands started to travel under my clothes and I could feel his hot breath on my neck. He wasn't wearing any clothes and I could feel his thing poking in between my legs. I've always known you're such a pretty girl, he said. Good thing your mama isn't around to protect you anymore. Ray slumped over his drink and watched as the melting ice faded into the brown liquid. 
He was fading, too. It was the only place other than the TV above the bar where he could stare that didn't make him feel awkward. Like so many barflies before him, he gravitated to the warm glow of this sad environment to drown in liquor for reasons that he himself couldn't quite define. Maybe it was in search of a sympathetic ear, or an effort to relive some of the thrills that the world of drinking used to provide him in his younger years, or maybe it was just to be openly what he really was in public, without judgment or criticism. It was the judging eyes and criticizing mouth of his ex-wife, Jessica, that he had become accustomed to. Until recently, when she finally had enough and washed her hands of him, and of them, and of everything that they had worked to be together. It was just a little thing. A tiny drink was enough to topple their entire ten-year marriage. It was enough for her to make the decision to break up their family, to rip their six-year-old daughter from their father's loving arms, condemning her to a life as a child of a broken home, and him to a life of cheap apartments and cheap frozen dinners eaten alone. Who the hell was Jessica to make such a call? It wasn't as though he was hurting anybody. He drank responsibly, paid their bills, and went to work on time. He didn't fuck other women or abuse his family. The worst-case scenario was that, on occasion, he would stumble in late at night and pass out with his clothes on. Was that so bad that she had to throw it all away? Fuck her. And fuck her new life with her new fiancé, Alan, and fuck his giant mansion and his expensive cars. What a cliché it was for her to jump into bed with Mr. Moneybags so soon after Ray had moved out. After all, it was the life that she had always wanted. But he just couldn't quite provide, no matter how many late hours he put in. As a junior-level sales rep for a small software company, he was able to give them a decent middle-class lifestyle. But by no stretch of the imagination were they considered well-to-do. He did his best. But it was never quite enough. And he suspected that this was the real reason that she had left. Only using his drinking as a guise to appear more righteous in her selfishness. Ray picked up his drink and swirled it around to evenly distribute the melted water with the whiskey. Then slurped the remnants from the glass. The taste so familiar like a song from his youth. It made him stutter and perspire at the cheeks as it warmed his gullet. The humming sound of the ancient air conditioner nagged at Kristen with a high-pitched whistle laced with a low whine, like a sick animal moaning with pain. She lay on her back, staring at the ceiling, or rather staring through it and through time itself, deep into her memories. She lay there, tracing over her life to this point, her father, and her journey that led her to this cheap hotel room on a mattress covered in blood. Sweet's blood, that had begun to turn into a dark black stain as the air oxidized the iron, and the air conditioner mocked her with its terrible whine. Kristen drew breath from her cigarette and let the smoke dance on her lips, drifting upwards to the ceiling seductively. She dropped her arm to her side, and her hand dangled the burning cigarette over the edge of the bed, spilling ash that floated down towards the floor, where it made its final resting place upon Sweet's lifeless, pimp face, collecting as a white pile on his dead eye. Kristen had met Sweet after she had run away from home at the age of fourteen. She grew up in a small trucking town outside of Grand Island, in a dumpy modular unit on a barren three-acre plot of land. Her father was a mechanic that specialized in semi-truck engine repair, a quiet man that drank his evenings away in front of the television. He never showed much interest in her or her mother, Janice's existence, as long as the refrigerator was stocked and dinner was ready on time. That was, until Kristen began to come of age early and developed some womanly features. That's when she began to notice his beady eyes upon her. 
She never noticed them before. But one day there they were, and she couldn't shake them for the unsettling feeling that they gave her, for reasons that she didn't quite understand yet, but would soon learn. He came to her late one humid summer night, sitting silently on the side of her bed as she slept. She woke, startled by the dark silhouette of his profile against the bright night sky, illuminating her bedroom window with a deep blue twilight. He slowly ran his greasy mechanic's thumb along her full bottom lip, and she pretended to still be asleep. Through the corner of her eye, she saw her mother pause in the hallway as she passed. Her mother looked at her father with a concerned glare, but he just stared back at her for a moment and then kicked the door shut with his boot. His touch was like acid on her skin, and every touch after felt the same, burning and awful. Kristen closed her eyes as these memories came to her in waves of shame and anger, but she didn't cry. The well of emotion had run dry and cracked in the burning suns of time. It wasn't until she was 14 years old that she finally got the courage to leave home. She packed only enough stuff to fit into a single backpack and about $60 with some change. She didn't have much of a plan. She wanted to go to Chicago or New York, basically anywhere that he couldn't find her. She caught a ride with a trucker named Dave at a Texaco outside of town. He was a cordial man that didn't ask too many questions. He must have assumed that girls who left home at her age had their reasons. He did, however, talk a lot about Jesus' love and how it could redeem any soul no matter how lost they were. On more than one occasion, Kristen caught him stealing a peek down her blouse through the rearview mirror, the beady eyes of men all the same. He just needed a glimpse to satisfy him for the long road ahead. She watched the barren landscape pass in the window. It represented a life that would soon be behind her, she didn't know what was ahead, but was hopeful. Maybe she could be a singer or an actress, as she had once dreamed. Dave dropped her off in Omaha, and she spent the night walking around a park downtown. That was where she met Tavon Jackson, a.k.a. Sweet. Sweet had swagger and charisma. He spoke fast and flashed money. He told her that with her looks she could earn all kinds of easy money, supply and demand, and demand was always high. Sweet was fun and exciting at first. Life with no rules, out on the fringe. You could have and do whatever you wanted. It was liberating compared to the rigid upbringing that she was used to. He was always talking her up, telling her how beautiful she was, but that would all soon change. Sweet was an astute student of the pimping arts, passed down for generations of street hustlers. The theory was simple. All women were bitches that just needed to be taught. If you had a pussy, you were a hoe in the making. All they needed was the right kind of motivation. Fear and affection were the cornerstones of good pimping. Fill a bitch up with all the affection that she so desperately craves, and then suddenly take it away and replace it with terror. Shower her with nice things, compliments, and love, then bring the hammer down on that bitch. Sweet's preferred method of bringing the hammer down was strangulation. It sent a clear message without damaging the merchandise. If done right, it didn't leave hideous bruises or costly bone fractures. With nothing but the strength of his own two hands, he could bring a bitch to edge of death just enough to catch a terrifying glimpse of it, so that they knew who had the power of God. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. On this particular evening, Sweet took Kristen too close to the edge and almost lost her there. But she didn't see the face of God. Instead, she saw the terrible grinning face of Father. She woke up on the floor of the dumpy hotel room, gasping for air. Sweet sat at the edge of the bed smoking a cigarette, looking at her like a master looks at his dog. Now get over here, bitch, and apologize. He unzipped his pants to release the all-too-familiar organ inside. She crawled over to the bed and went to work, 
cupping Sweet's testicles with her left hand while taking the length of him into her sore throat. With her other hand, she reached into her back pocket and pulled out a folding blade, using the tips of her fingers. Sweet moaned. That's right, just like Daddy taught you, he said, unaware of the literal implication for Kristen. She extended the blade and gripped it with her palm. As she suspected Sweet was about to come, she drove the knife straight into his pelvis, at the inguinal line where the thigh merges with the pubic region. Sweet shrieked and pulled back with surprise at the sudden rush of pain. His anger was quick with intentions of retaliation, but the damage was too great having severed the femoral artery inside. Blood came in massive, warm spurts like a running hose, and Sweet's black skin was ghostly white within seconds. Oh shit, girl, what did you do? He sobbed and tried to stop the bleeding with his hands. Kristen smiled. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Isn't that right, sweet? You motherfucker! She screamed. You fucking bitch, I'm gonna fucking... Sweet sat up too quickly and lost blood pressure to the brain. His eyes rolled and toppled over onto the floor. There were some spasms and high breath whines before he laid still. There were some spasms and high breath whines before he went still, laying stiff beside the bed where he continues to lay at this moment with a pile of cigarette ash collecting on his face, a human ashtray in death, the same as he was in life. Kristen realized that she needed to leave before his rotting stink drew someone's attention. There was a dive bar up the street that she could hit for a quick trick and some cash before she left town. Omaha had run its course. Time to move on to better places. Ray noticed a young woman enter the mostly empty bar in his peripheral view. She wore a skin-tight pink skirt that rode up high on her thighs. Obviously a working girl, but God, was she beautiful. She approached the bar next to him and leant over it with her elbows so that her ass was high in the air, an intentional stance of the trade. She smacked gum between her teeth and smiled when he looked over at her. "'What are you drinking?' Ray asked, knowing that he should avoid her. "'Vodka and Red Bull,' she said with a childish flirtation in her tone. Something about her got Ray's pulse going. Just being near her was like a dose of adrenaline.' He raised his hand to the bartender to indicate that he was going to pay for her drink. Thanks, sweetie, she smiled. When her drink arrived, she held it up to her beautiful mouth and played with the straw using her tongue, letting it ride along her luscious bottom lip. Her face was young, maybe twenty. She still had the baby fat in her cheeks, but her eyes had the depth of a much older soul. She held intense eye contact with Ray, but to her... He was just a Mark, a John, another disgusting pig that she had to please, that wanted to run his beady eyes and his greasy hands over her body. She placed her hand on his knee and whispered, Let's get out of here. Ray knew that it wasn't real, but he needed her. He needed to play along, to feel something, a connection, even if it was just a fantasy. Even if he had to pay for that brief moment of human contact and release. She took his hand and guided him towards the back door. His legs swayed flimsy. He was drunk with excitement, entranced. But he felt a mounting shame for what he had become. As though he was sinking deeper into a pit of darkness. In that moment he desperately wanted to change. To stop drinking and wasting away for his daughter and for himself. Tomorrow, he would begin anew. Tomorrow, he could change, but tonight, he needed this. Behind the bar, there was an alleyway that was secluded by a dumpster. They took refuge in its shadow, and he pressed her against the wall. Those fierce eyes and supple lips held him. He ran his thumb along her cheek, then traced it over the cuffs of her bottom lip. She smiled and below her waist, she drew her blade.
She breathes her hot breath into my ear. She kisses my neck. She is such an angel. Makes me feel like heaven on earth. My friends left me behind because they said she was cruel. They felt as if she was gonna hurt me. I refuted the idea. It's kind of funny. I found her on this dating app on my phone called... Well, I think it was called... Something like... Heart Finders. But that didn't matter. I just wanted to be close to her. She filled my dreams every night. And she made them a reality every day. She was so beautiful, and quite frankly, sexy. She turned me on by a mere touch or kiss. It even felt like she controlled me, but I shook off the feeling. She had dark grey eyes, blonde hair, a light tan, a beautiful body, and the voice of an angel. She was so seductive, and sometimes she would be like a demon. There were times when she seemed strange. When I wanted to be with my friends, she would be downright evil and yell at me, claiming she was always lonely. So we would end up having sex to rid ourselves of the hate and mainly to please her. She would also get violent and hurt me. I brushed it off, thinking she was playing rough, but it wasn't playing to me. She started to become a part of my nightmares. She would torture me in my dreams, her eyes a fiery red. Her fangs would drive deep into my neck, and she would take a little bit of life from me each night, and she would grow even more powerful over me. I grew so weak over time. I coughed up blood. I couldn't eat or sleep. Every night I would hear her. Oh, come on baby. Sleep for me. It will end sooner. Her voice would be in my ears, and it would feel as if she was next to me. I would look, however, and she wasn't there. My face grew hollow. I lost 40 pounds, and my mental state began to fall apart. But I grew used to the pain, and I faced her again once more, knowing this would be the day I would die. I would only want to die if it was because of her. I felt her embrace once more, and she released her talons and her venom. She smiled at me, and her fangs pierced my neck and the pain filled my body, but I liked the pain. I loved her. She looked into my eyes as my vision began to go into the dark, and her eyes glowed as she said, Your love was a weakness, my dear. She smiled, and I died in her arms as she began to tear me apart and consume me. Love is an angel and a demon. One way or another, it will consume your soul.